Good day, everybody. This is Paul Sim speaking to you from Ifa Pharma offices in London. Well done for being here on time. Um, we're just about to get going. Uh, I'm going to hold it open another 30 seconds before I do. I can see that lots of people are still signing in. So don't go anywhere. We will start properly in 30 seconds. Okay, thank you very much everybody for signing in on time. Uh, my name once again is Paul Sims. I'm chairman at IFA Pharma. I'm calling you today from London. And today we have a webinar, as you can hopefully see from your screen, called Deeper Patient Insights for Stronger Patient Outcomes, something that I'm sure we all wish to achieve. Uh, so it's, uh, it's already uh, obvious, I hope, that patient insights and garnering greater insights uh, is a crucial part of uh, being a pharmaceutical company in a modern era, uh, the key to the creation of actually almost any successful and targeted program, any brand new product, any existing product, they very much dictate the delivery of successful outcomes. But are we getting enough insights? Are we getting rich enough and deep enough insights? Well, the key question that uh, we hope to tackle today is how we actually achieve that. We must construct frameworks. We must help patients articulate what really matters to them, uh, what's a uh, value to the healthcare system as well as to patients. And we need to hit on the various critical touch points that patients experience as they go through a, uh, a journey, uh, uh, hopefully into being uh, better than they started out. So um, we're going to be hearing from a few people in just a moment on how indeed we do build those smarter frameworks, how indeed we do gain that new understanding, and how we can perhaps even lead to more targeted and personalized services in order to achieve those better outcomes. So uh, I'm going to be joined today by the happy smiley faces that you see on your screen right now. Um, I would like to say a particular thank you to Claire, who is the person in the top center. Uh, and the reason is because uh, Claire, together with her company, IQVIA, uh, have uh, been our partner on making sure this webinar today actually uh, takes place. Uh, and indeed, Claire's going to share a few insights with us to kick it off, um, but uh, absolutely couldn't have done this without them. So really appreciate, appreciate uh, what uh, IQVIA have done to get this webinar into creation. Uh, and it's been a very popular webinar as well. I think we just hit 1,200 signups just before we uh, we signed uh, we started. Uh, so uh, so it's clearly a topic that a lot of people care about. We have a very global audience, uh, and of course, I hope to hear from you as an audience. But let me just quickly uh, introduce the uh, other speakers as well. So. Um, Oliver, on your top left, uh, is part of Bayer's G4A digital health team. If you're not familiar with, with that, it doesn't actually say G4A on his uh, title there, but uh, he's very much uh, responsible for bringing in uh, a lot of uh, interesting and exciting talent into Bayer in the form of startups and other entrepreneurship. Uh, and uh, he indeed drives intelligent strategy and new business development across the EMEA region uh, at Bayer. Uh, contributes more than 10 years experience in health and service related innovation. So really pleased you can be with us, Oliver. Thank you very much. Uh, directly under that is Desiree. Desiree is uh, joining us uh, as the director of Otsuka Patient Support Strategy and Insights. She's responsible for strategic option generation. I actually don't know what that means. You might have to explain, Desiree. Uh, and assessment, business planning, data management, and insights. Uh, and uh, that enables the patient support program to improve the overall experience uh, at uh, Otsuka. And uh, she's actually spent more than 15 years with us in pharma in various different roles uh, and uh, comes together with a lot of experience. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Claire, I have mentioned already, but I should also say that she's a health psychology specialist with over 10 years experience working both commercially and academically as a psychologist uh, and uh, has a lot of experience in health related behavior change, something which we all know 
to be increasingly important as we pursue uh, more patient outcomes. Uh, and uh, she really does uh, understand this area very well. She's also a strategist and knows how to design, implement, project manage, and deliver uh, programs that uh, come and meet great standards. So thank you so much, Claire. Uh, Teresa is a face you may well know if you've been to IFA Pharma events recently because she, as you can see, there was uh, an award winner uh, not so long ago. Uh, she identifies as a patient first and foremost, but uh, has absolutely taken many things to a, a higher level. Um, she uh, suffered, unfortunately, from breast cancer as a 36-year-old, uh, but that really led her to understand how important it is to empower people to take over, take control over their lives and their health, uh, and very much that the patient needs to be at the center of the health system. Uh, so Teresa is, is a wonderful coach and does a lot of work with many in the industry, uh, and indeed is here today to hold us all accountable to the patients, and I hope that, Teresa, you uh, speak up and take part in the conversation going forward. So thank you for being here. Uh, and last but certainly not least is Daniel. Daniel, really pleased, also uh, been uh, at several Life Pharma events. Uh, he's the Patient Engagement and Advocacy Lead for Europe, Middle East and Africa at Janssen. Uh, he's part of a global multifunctional leadership team that helps the company to engage with patients in a systematic way and helps to build partnerships and developing solutions. Uh, so uh, he's actually been with Janssen J&J &J since 2001. Uh, he joined in the communications area, working in oncology and infectious diseases, um, but uh, latterly has built this external relationships um, in multiple areas and indeed is doing a lot of great work at Janssen, so really pleased. So as you can see, we've got basically the ideal set of people that we could possibly hope for on this webinar. Um, so that's them, and before I hand over to Claire, I'm just going to um, remind everybody that they have a questions box on the right-hand side of your screen. So perhaps you could indicate that you haven't already fallen asleep by saying a quick hello to me in there. Um, Carol, hello. <laughs> first on the first on the buzzer, Carol. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm getting some more hellos in now. So thank you so much. Much appreciated, everybody. Uh, right. Um, please, now that you're familiar with this, don't be shy. Make sure you answer your questions. It's the only way to make sure we cover the topics that you care about. So get involved as we go ahead. Uh, and I will pause the conversation from time to time and come to your questions. Um, yes, there will be a recording of the webinar available to all of those who've signed up, whether you're here or not. You don't need to email me afterwards. I can already see a few people have asked me that question. So, Claire, over to you, uh, and uh, you're going to take us through a few slides, I believe. That's great. Thanks very much, Paul, and uh, welcome to everyone who's who's with us. So, as Paul mentioned, I'm a health psychologist, um, and what I'm going to talk to you about very briefly is just how we pull um, kind of the discipline of health psychology, which is a behavioural science, how we pull that through in IQVIA to help us um, kind of garner our patient insights, but also turn those into um, meaningful outputs that are going to help generate outcomes for for patients um, so if you move forward paul so just a quick starter so health psychology is the practice of applying psychological methods to the study of behavior relevant to health illness and health care um, and the reason we use it is because what it can help us to do is to understand um, put support in place and also ultimately change health related behaviours and when we talk about behaviours we're not just talking about actions as in take a medicine or go to an appointment what we're also talking about are behaviours around your emotional response or how well you're coping um, or for example um, your kind of beliefs and your thoughts around the illness as well um, and so all of these things, you know, we can look to try and not only understand and gain insight on, but then also start to think about, OK, well, well why is that having an impact and, and what does that mean in terms of patient outcomes? And when you use behaviour change theory and behaviour change principles, um, they will tend to demonstrate better results than non-theory based support. Um, and the reason for that is you're sort of going beyond that 
okay, well, here's a problem and we think this might be a way we can solve it or this sounds like a good idea, to actually looking at, well, what do we know? What do we understand to be able to help and support people make these changes? So, for example, you know, we may gain from an insight that, that somebody feels actually the biggest problem for me at the moment is I don't feel very in control. I feel like my MS is controlling me rather than me being able to control it. And so we know then what somebody's wanting to achieve, um, but they may not themselves then know how to do that. And that's where health psychology and behaviour change principles can come in because we can then draw on that knowledge and that science to help people move to a place of feeling more in control. And the final thing is then, you know, when we look at building out services or, or you know, support for, for within healthcare, um, it's also really important that we look at how we can combine approaches. You know, it, it's a phrase that's used a lot, but it does hold true. One size doesn't fit all. Um, the reason for that is everybody's different. Um, and so what we're looking at is when we're building out those services, how can we make sure that we're pulling in different methods and different approaches um, because that's likely to be more effective. So, for example, moving beyond just education um, into some of those kind of broader, perhaps more social support or practical support. So if you move to the next slide, Paul. And, you know, Quite often we see that lots of companies are getting lots and lots of insights to start with. So there's lots of interviews with patients and healthcare professionals, um, you know, bringing all of that information through. Um, but then it's, well, how do you then translate that? How, how do you turn those insights again into things that are actionable? Um, so things that we can do to um, actually what's going to inform our support design and so the combi framework which is on the screen at the moment it's a theoretical framework that helps us to understand the barriers and the facilitators of those behaviors that I mentioned before so those emotional led behaviors those belief behaviors and also those actual physical behaviors as well and what it does is it divides these behavioural factors into three categories, and that's capability, opportunity and motivation. And all of these categories can directly influence behaviour, um, but capability and opportunity can also indirectly affect behaviour by impacting motivation. And what this framework allows us to do is to take all of those great insights and, and what we've heard and what we've learned and start to think about, OK, well, what does that mean when we're wanting to build out support? So if the, if the um, problems that people are experiencing are around capability, so that can be things like a level of knowledge, ability around planning. Um, it can be physical capability. So, for example, using uh, having to self-administer an injection um, if you've got difficulty with fine motor movement. And so those are definite challenges and the way that you would start to think about supporting those would be some of your more traditional services like education and training. When we look at opportunity, this is then starting to look at the landscape that's around an individual so, you know, it's looking at, well, what, what are perhaps some of those healthcare system barriers? What does their level of social support look like? What's the impact potentially of stigma or cultural norms? So helping us to start to think about, OK, that broader um, societal and system factors that, again, are influencing how well somebody's able to adjust and cope and manage um, living with with a chronic illness. And then in the middle is your motivation. And so those are those kind of intrinsic drivers. Um, and there's a, a lot where the kind of psychology starts to come in, um, thinking about the impact of levels of confidence, perceptions around illness, beliefs about treatment, 
um, you know, mood state, how they are all impacting how well somebody is able to manage day to day living with their disease. And this is really important because, as I've said, what it does is it allows us to start to frame some of those insights that we're getting through and start to look at them in ways around, OK, well, how do we address these? How can we start to, to support them? And we may not be able to support everything. We can't change everything. But it also stops us just thinking in a very narrow way and perhaps only thinking about the practical solutions or the other way, only thinking about, OK, well, if we can get somebody motivated, that will be fine um, because we may be able to, someone may feel very motivated, but, but experience challenges socially that prevent that. Um, and so we use this to start to be able to then think about, OK, what do these insights tell us in terms of then building out services and support? So if you move to the next slide, Paul. And then what we look to do is then look at, OK, well, what does the evidence tell us are some of the ways that we can start to um, change and address some of these challenges that are coming up? Um, and some of these will be very obvious. So some of them will still be things like education and training. Um, but it's then also bringing in some of those other active ingredients um, that aim to change behavior by targeting those determinants that we've called out before. And so that can be things like, um, you know, helping somebody to recognize unhelpful thought patterns and how you can recognize those and also start to reframe them. It can be things like self-monitoring and self-reflection to help build that sense of confidence and control. So it's really about being able to then map not only using science and kind of academic methods to, to get our insights, but also using that science to be able to look at, OK, well, what can we do then to help change this situation for the better for the patient or the family or the healthcare provider? And as I've said earlier, quite often what we can get from talking and, or listening to patients or listening to healthcare professionals is we get a, can get quite a big list of what are the problems um, and sometimes they themselves don't necessarily know how to fix that so again i might think i'm really struggling i'm really feeling out of control here um but not know what to do or not just have that opportunity to take a step back and think well what's going to help me feel more in control and that really is then where the service needs to come in and think about okay well what can we teach what can we upskill what can we give some additional resources to to help address some of those those issues that are coming up and if you move to the next slide paul and then i think it really then is about continuing to kind of learn and in, involve um, patients caregivers healthcare professionals you know through this person-centered approach and this is then starting to look at, OK, well, if we're starting to build out these services, we're starting to think about what, what is it that we're going to, to do. That's almost our starting point, if you like, in terms of development. And then it's involving the end users and as many people as possible that are relevant to then the development out of those services. And it goes beyond just looking at kind of user testing or getting feedback on how something looks and feels, but goes to another level of looking at, you know, is this motivating? Is this informative? Is it actually going to achieve what we want it to achieve? So is it going to help somebody feel more confident or is it going to help somebody, um, you know, with some of their practical issues that, that they are having? And it moves beyond you know, just prioritising, you know, the academics know best or the researchers know best and starts to go, OK, well, we've got an idea, we've listened, here's, here's where we think we need to go based on the evidence to date, but now let's evolve that and work with you to kind of build that out into something that people feel 
is they can use is relevant for them they feel confident to use it so it gives a level of autonomy they feel confident there's a competence you know it's easy to access or it feels relevant and also then how much does that meet what it is that that you're trying to achieve um, and so it's about considering patients and again healthcare professionals or caregivers as equal partners during the development process and i think that's something we see quite often there, there's a lot of research done up front and then the solution kind of gets wheeled out and, and i think there's a definite opportunity for a lot more kind of co-creation and bringing people through on that journey so that we're not just repeating um, the same kind of services again and again we are actually able to look at well how do we make this work in the best way possible and then just moving to my final slide um, and then just to wrap it up really it's about continuing to learn and evolve which I'm sure will not be a, a surprise to anybody but um, you know once we've got a service out there it's not just looking at okay well have have people enrolled are people yeah. using it are people satisfied that's really important and they are really good indicators um but also is it doing what we want it to do and also talking to people who are part of that service or have been using it and saying okay well how do you feel at six months down the line how has it helped you kind of change or has it not what could we do that that could improve it and you know i think there's a dual my final point is there's a dual approach here around we want to offer support and we want to build something that's going to to help people um, meet the change that they want to to meet um but we don't necessarily need to be holding their hand all the time the key thing really is what can we do to upskill and to um get people so that they do have a level of autonomy and a level of self-empowerment um, and so it's about trying to shift that change so that we are empowering people um, to have the skills and the support when they need it um, but not necessarily having to um, do something that's very intensive all the time but to learn that and to do that we need to look at okay well are we making an impact and are we making a change and learning and feeding that back in through the design process. Thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Thank you very much for that. Uh, much appreciated. Um, I can see the audience has sent in uh, a few questions, which we'll come to in just a moment. Make sure that you get your questions in. Um, I thought that was a, an interesting session about not just uh, getting the insights, but indeed how we build on them. So thank you. Um, can I ask my fellow panelists, uh, I'm not sure you're looking at the, the ch uh, messages I'm sending you, uh, to mute yourselves when you're not uh, talking just because the audio is not perfect and I'm getting a few audience comments uh, saying that uh, some people are finding it a little tricky to listen in. So please do uh, mute yourselves if you can. Uh, there seems to be a bit of background noise. Um, okay, so um, thank you, Claire, as I said, for setting us up. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is um, firstly remind you who we all are, as you can see, uh, and secondly, to uh, get you in the audience uh, to participate in a little poll question. So um, we talked about um, gaining those insights there from Claire. Um, I'm very keen to see where we all are in the room. So if you look at your screen right now, you will see a question appear upon it. Uh, what are the biggest barriers to adopting or scaling patient engagement in your organization? Obviously, if you uh, work for a consultancy or someone else of that nature, please do answer on behalf of your clients if you can. Um, and uh, the rest of you, please do answer. I'm making this tough by allowing you to only select one. Uh, so uh, is it the limited awareness of potential and entrenched culture? Is it a lack of senior level buy-in? cost concerns perhaps? Uh, is it lack of capabilities, know-how? We don't actually know how to do it. Uh, is it because, uh, as we've already trailed uh, a little bit, there is no easy or universal engagement framework that employees can follow? Or finally, is it the regulatory or uh, questions of ethics uh, that make it uh, difficult? So 
Uh, I can see that roughly half of you have voted, so I'm going to hold that open another three seconds to get the rest of you in. Come on, everyone. Three, two, one. Right, thank you very much. Got nearly all of you there, so that's great. Uh, let's have a look at the results. Okay, it's a relatively even spread. I'm actually a little bit surprised that it's so even. Um, roughly, yeah, 20% for everyone. Um, so, yeah, uh, basically I conclude that it's everything uh, that, uh, <laughs> that is a barrier uh, and uh, certainly nothing that isn't. Um, I'd be very interested to hear now from our panel. Um, perhaps you can speak to some of the things that uh, Claire mentioned and also perhaps give your own uh, sense of where your organization is on this spectrum. So who wants to go first? Well, I'll happily kickstart it, Paul. This is Daniel. Great. Um, <laughs> I think uh, from the company here where we sit, we, we, we definitely are almost at saying it's really coordinated and cross-functional. And when I say almost, it's because it's always work in progress. And, and if I look at the answers here, uh, I remember having suggested an all of the above as uh, as one potential answer. And, that and that's true, probably actually. going to be it's it good. because yeah. it's a <laughs> yeah it's a it's a mental shift. We need a mental shift where everybody understands that there is a way of doing business. There was a way of doing business. We need to change it, and we need to change it because it has a reason for um, health economics. It has a reason for better outcomes. It has therefore a commercial reason, societal reason. And then when people get it, you find capabilities. Then you find the regulatory environment is changing. And then there is, of course, more awareness. So I think that mental shift, it asks for a lot of work. Uh, I, I think Claire will, will, of course, agree on that. Uh, nothing is more difficult to, to achieve than, than a, a complete uh, behavioral change of, of, a, of a bigger company or, or a bigger group of people. So I think that's why we have an equal spread here. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I, Anyone yeah, else? And I, yeah. yeah, I think it's um, it's true, and, and it's, it's often you know posed to me as well is you know we can you help us change our kind of our behaviors internally within the organization as as well as thinking about kind of that that patient behavior change and and I think you know I think one of the ones that that frequently comes up and and I agree you know there, there's often a, a spread and and you know a lot of these can be issues but I think the that kind of regulatory environment I think particularly when you are trying to perhaps do things that feel a little bit different or a little bit challenging. Um, I, I think that can be, you know, certainly in my experience, that that can be a bit of a blocker, um, you know, and, and we might have clients who, who are really keen to do things, um, but, you know, then kind of it almost falls at that final hurdle when, when you're then trying to, to put that service in place um, and you know obviously it's there for a reason and and we have to you know always think about the ethics and, and make sure we're not doing things that that are out of the remit but we do need to push the envelope a little bit we we do need to do things differently um, and you know it, it's how we can try and bring some of that kind of regulatory change along as well um, and that's both within a particular organization and, and that's something we always help to do by kind of bringing in other examples and saying, you know, this has been done. Um, but, you know, also how, you know, the, the bigger question is how can we do that perhaps a bit more en masse um, to, to be able to, to really start to put services out there that are, um, that are what people want, not just what are the safe things to do. Great. Who else? Yeah, great points. Uh, this is Oliver from Buyers G4A. So, I, I mean, what what we've seen once these initial hurdles like senior management buy-in and you know ethical concerns and the like uh, have been cleared, it, it's really how to help people execute on it because it's. I mean, if if we think back on what what Claire shared, I mean that that's a specific set of capabilities and a new way of working so you can't expect uh, you know R&D uh, colleagues or you know marketeers to just all of a sudden know how to do that and so what what in our experience has has worked great is to uh, help those willing colleagues to actually do it by bringing on board a, a set of dedicated resources that have human-centered design knowledge that 
you know are uh, you know are very well worth with all the uh, let's say the framework that you have developed as a company you know and know all the legalities can pull together best practices to support those specific teams uh, at least in my perspective that's the that's the critical aspect um, and it also relates to why you should do it right I mean you as a project manager no matter in R&D or commercial or wherever you're faced with a decision where to invest your budget and you know investing your budget in upfront heavy patient insight generation you know you, you have to really believe it and have, have maybe done it before you do that and I think we're going to touch the let's say the KPI side of things a bit later and how to translate those insights into commercial success but I think that's you know making people confident that they can have a success and in my opinion will almost certainly have a better success than if they you know did not involve the patient is a is a key factor yeah I agree uh, with uh, with you Oliver this Daniel I completely agree with that point Okay, everyone. Um, this has been very interesting. I'm going to, I can see that uh, the audience here is being very vocal and, oops, I've just managed to click off the uh, screen that I need. Uh, there we are, back again. Uh, so I'm going to read out a few audience questions at this stage and um, feel free to answer these. So um, James says, in the US, we have mass science denial. Uh, I guess that's the anti-vax movement uh, part of that. How do you propose we get buy-in for patient self-reporting, uh, particularly in light of the way self-reporting has been weaponized by the drug prevention groups? Interesting question there. Uh, Vishaka uh, asks, will this model help the pharma company throughout the R&D journey? So that's a very open question. Uh, if yes, how? Um, this is for Paul. Oh, wow. I've, I don't normally get answered the question. Since you see markets globally, I would like your perspective. I'm in the US and have been talking about behavior change, RW value, patient insights, etc. My impression is that the States has been much slower to pick up on these concepts than Europe. Do you have any thoughts on the US finally picking up the pace? I actually think that the US um, has been far more engaged in attempting to, uh, to work with patients than Europe, if I can compare the two. Uh, but I would also say that uh, the trust issues are stronger in the US, given the DTC advertising that's been obviously around for a long time. So more of a barrier to actually gaining meaningful interaction uh, and engagement. So that would be my immediate answer to that. So I don't know if the others want to comment on that one. I'll read out one or two more. Um, Question for Claire. When Claire discusses gaining deeper insights into services regarding program fidelity, satisfaction, and outcomes, how do you advocate for these types of deeper insights when you aren't the one in charge of the program? For example, an expanded access program run by Medical Affairs and you are leading advocacy. So that's a, a few. I, I realize there's a few more questions I haven't answered. I'll get to those shortly. But uh, does anyone want to grab any of those immediately? Paul, Paul I, uh, this is Daniel. I'd like to make a comment on... Um... The question on will will these insights help uh, the industry uh, struggle with R&D, and I'm using my own words here. Um, we published an article, actually, uh, a colleague from Janssen published an article uh, on a model calculating how much money can be spared in R&D if you engage with patients and co-design your clinical trials with them. Uh, because you will have an enormous reduction in amendments, you will have a higher recruitment, and so if you just take of that type of, of 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 business result, it's not an outcome at the end; it's a business result internally. It allows you to invest, if you're investing the same amount of money, in much more research, and therefore you should also be covering a gap uh, in R&D. So I think definitely yes, the answer is yes. Uh, engaging with patients early will uh, bring you a higher return. Excellent. Who else? Desiree, we haven't heard from you yet, I don't think. Hey, thank you for the question. Um, regarding patient insights, especially starting in clinical trials, I think that's a really interesting point. I saw an article last week talking about how patients um, are hesitant to even enroll in trials unless they know that they can actually receive product in the commercialization of the product. So I think that engaging patients early on, not only for the reasons that uh, were brought up previously, but also to engage them to understand 
potentially what barriers exist even that early on in the journey and then what barriers will exist throughout because then you can help solution to see what should actually be designed for them in the long term to ensure that they can actually access their products. So I think it really does start from the very beginning in the clinical stage and throughout commercialization. Thanks. What about some of the other questions? Claire, there was one for you specifically. Do you want to yeah. take that? Yeah, so if I've understood the question correctly around kind of the, the fidelity of the intervention or, or the service once it goes out, and I think the certainly how we try and address it um, is we almost, well, what we do is, is build out a, what we call a blueprint of the service, which in R&D world, for example, is, is essentially would be like your protocol. Um, and so it's not just saying, well, we're going to do a website or we're going to do a call center. It's very, very descriptive around the frameworks that I talked about that says, OK, well, what are we actually trying to address? How are we going to address it? And what needs to be in that? You know, what are the rules in that service? What What's the content and what techniques is that tying back to? And so getting that kind of prescriptive level of detail around your service design to the same way that you would have that level of detail for a trial or a, a, you know for a trial or a, a kind of piece of, of empirical research and then using that also as your your benchmark to kind of check back and go okay well we've said this is what the service we want to do and what it should look like how are we measuring how are we achieving against those goals um i think the other part of that question again if i understood it correctly is you know almost if if it comes out of your hands and and maybe you're a bit restricted on what information you can get back from it um again i think that's about then trying to build that solution together and, and understanding okay well well here's what good looks like um, and what are we going to put in place to be able to show that? So the, the measurement and the evaluation has to be done alongside that design. So it, it's not something that then is just done and thought of at the end because it all needs to be, to be meeting up. But I think the key thing around trying to get that fidelity and that confidence that it's doing what you want is, is to get to that level of kind of um, uh, detail around what that design and what that service needs to look like. Thank you, Claire. Yeah, is, I'm very. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry, no, this is Desiree. I was just going to comment a little bit more on that. Yeah. Um, regarding go for it. just the process, I think she brings up really good points. Just understanding from the get go what actually is the problem we're trying to solve. I think um, at Otsuka, we're really fortunate to really go above and beyond for our patients and providers and try to understand what's happening. So we mapped that patient journey at the very beginning. And then we mapped also the HCP and staff journey. And then we validate our assumptions with patients. So from that, we adjust the journey maps and we align on the problems we're going to solve as an organization, which allows for that buy-in you know, from top down. And then we, we find the solutions for the gaps along the way. So instead of just looking at typical services where maybe it's hub support or something else, we really try to figure out what are we trying to solve and then come up with potentially very unique solutions for the patients. That way we're not just plugging in uh, something that potentially already exists to make it easy, but that we're truly solving for the patient. And then certainly making sure that it's an iterative process. We look at the KPIs, evaluate how it's going, and then adjust as needed. So those are really great points well taken, Claire. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I, I also oh. think that just just maybe to to add on this, uh, and also maybe to link in the the first question. So, I mean, you have to be ready to accept that patients don't like where you're going or where your initial hypothesis is, right? I mean, just to give an example, we we had a, I mean, some of us, uh, somewhere in the organization, we had a project that that that's intended to do a chatbot for you know patients, and you know patients then. Uh, just told us, hey, uh, we don't want a chatbot, you know, it's just not helping us. And uh, that, that was a tough message for the project team to swallow. I mean, you, you had applied for the budget, you had, you know, leadership expectations and, and all that good stuff. So, uh, and, and 
you know, to, to the first question. So if you, if you want to be um, in the boat with critical patients, you know, maybe in, in the case of vaccines, then, well, you have to work with them and, and really understand their points uh, uh, that, that bring them, uh, you know, uh, against, against your initiative initially. So, um, and maybe there is not a real solution for that, that, that works for you in the first place, but uh, if, if you're not willing to accept that leadership, then I think you're, you're not in for the real thing. Yeah, Thank you. Very, um, I can, can I, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but can no, I just, I, I'm really acutely aware that Teresa, our patient uh, representative, hasn't had a chance to talk yet. And I would love to hear from Teresa in terms of what you think of uh, where we're going at the moment and, uh, and indeed whether or not you think uh, there's anything that we're missing that's important. Yeah, thank you very much because I was taking notes and <laughs> really appreciate <laughs> you letting me talk. I I actually uh, I totally agree uh, with some things that have been said here. Very interesting points. Uh, Claire mentioned that uh, uh, patients are active participants, and uh, Daniel talked about uh, changing the mindset. I think that we all it's the the mindset that uh, the new mindset that we need to go towards this, as, as we were saying now, is uh, understanding that patients want to lead and uh, patients want to be involved and want to build that partnership with their healthcare professionals. They are not passive. So when we talk about patients, we we need to talk about, we need to bear in mind that, uh, that they have a lot to say, not only to receive, but a lot to say and, uh, yeah, and sometimes uh, take decisions as well as to well this product is not for us or we are not interested even if it's something that from the pharma company is like uh, well a, a great solution thank you Teresa um, yeah does anyone have any immediate feedback or comments on Teresa's point uh, that uh, that indeed patients need to be more uh, or or can be more proactive here and all that, well, I we think will I need Go oh, ahead, no, go on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, mine, mine was very quick. I, I was just going to say, I think just picking up on something Teresa said, and it, it is a challenge that, that I face sometimes with, with some of the, the designs that we try and put in, is there does sometimes have to be an acceptance that actually if we're helping somebody, if we're helping with shared decision making, if, if we're helping with empowerment, if we're helping, you know, to patients to be active within their, their, that kind of healthcare system, sometimes those decisions aren't going to necessarily go the way of the pharma company. Um, but the balance, the counterbalance to that is that for those that it is right for in terms of treatment or service or, or whatever, it will be a better experience and it is likely to, to, to kind of fuel better outcomes because yes. of that joint, that joint decision. And it's being done yeah. actively. Yeah. Yeah. Because I was going to, to I was going to say something actually. similar. So go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to say that this is the way to build trust as well. If yes. you're doing for the other. Yes. Uh, go ahead, yeah, Daniel. Go ahead. I think Theresa might. <laughs> Sorry. Be Sorry. Yes. No. No. I was <laughs> cut away. I think. I wanted to add to that. I said it's trust, but it's also an obvious thing to do because if you are coming with a solution that at the end nobody is going to want, what is the investment? What's the return on investment? It's going to be weak. So basically, we're investing any solutions we come up with will always cost money and a lot of money. So doing it together with patients, creating it together, it will at least ensure that what comes out of it will have a usage and an outcome. And at the end, we're all going for outcome based. Healthcare will, will end there. So it's an obvious thing to do um, rather than to say, okay, let's go for a solution. They don't like it. We'll still want to implement it. That does not make any sense. Huh? That's, uh, that's uh, investing money in, in something where the outcome is going to be much less than what you would want to. Okay, uh, I'm going to take a quick um, pause in the conversation, take advantage of the pause in the conversation to ask everybody another question. If you look at your screen right now, this one is a bit more about your motivation for uh, doing indeed what you're doing. So what's the primary reason for scaling 
scaling notice, not just doing it, but scaling it, uh, scaling patient engagement within your organization. Is it a simple desire to be more patient centric? You, uh, you feel that your organization is, is that is, that is uh, all that you're trying to do and it doesn't matter about anything else. Uh, ultimately, it's because it enables greater commercial performance at the end of the day, or perhaps you could also say the economic sustainability of the company. Um, it enables better approval or access with regulators and payers, allows us to actually launch our medicines as we may, might wish. Uh, insights and data to enable creation of new services and products. So uh, broadening what it is that the company can provide and offer is your primary uh, reason. Or finally, uh, and I realize this, this might feel like it clashes with the third one, demonstrate patient outcomes to pay the payers and others, but this one isn't, isn't about uh, the launch stage. This one is about the post-launch. So um, please do uh, answer this one and I'll hold that open. I see roughly half of you, the uh, attentive half, have voted again quickly, but the less attentive half, I will give you three more seconds. Three, two, one. Thank you so much to everybody who voted. Let us have a look at the results. I think this could be quite interesting. Uh, okay, so we actually have a bit more variation this time. Uh, nearly two-fifths of people saying that it's the insights and data to enable the creation of new services and products, which again, that is actually a surprise to me. I didn't think that would be as popular as it is, uh, that this desire to go beyond um, our medicines uh, is, is such a, a, a reason, uh, a strong reason, that actually might even um, contradict or, or, or go in the face of some of the things we've already said on this uh, webinar, perhaps. So um, very interested to hear any comments on that. Um, clearly, <laughs> approval is maybe we don't have um, too many market access people in the audience today, but clearly approval is not the is not the key. Any comments yeah. on that from the panel? Well, my comment would be uh, that uh, I would have loved to see people uh, say better services and products and not just new services and products, but okay, that's a detail. Um, I think it's very product oriented. Eh? We're looking too much at our own uh, belly here um, because basically we're in, an, in a bigger framework. There's many stakeholders involved in healthcare. And so for me, the last one uh, is actually what we need to come to, it's outcomes. Uh, that was all the title of the uh, of the webinar. We, we we should be doing this to prove better outcomes, to get to better outcomes, and that will also create a better commercial performance because you will be in an environment where there is more money for innovation, and you will be there with solutions that have a high outcome. So they will also have a high return. So again, I personally I believe uh, number two and number four go together, and the others are ways to get there. Uh, but finally, I see the audience likes their products they're producing and they want to make more of it. It's fine, but it's not the ultimate goal for me. Mm. Thank you Maybe for just to answer. comment on that, it, I think, you know, if, if you think of the nature of, of drugs, I mean, those are molecules, so it's hard to kind of co-design them. Of course, you can co-design, uh, you know, a lot of the things around it, like, like trial protocols and, you know, patient support programs and whatnot. But I think if it comes to real new digital services like digital therapeutics, that where the mode of action is behavior change, then uh, I don't think it's even optional to involve patients early on, but it's, it, it's imperative. Because in the end, what, what you try to do here is change behavior. So if you, to, again, to Claire's uh, introductory session, if you're not able to understand what motivates uh, and, and triggers behavior change, then I think you have missed the point. And I think for for those, I mean, I can speak from own experience. I mean, we at G4A do a lot of uh, service design on, and, and, you know, our goal is to uh, work on digital therapeutics and all that good stuff. So uh, here for, for us, it's part of the DNA. So for, it's not even a question uh, if we want to do it. But I, I can see where, um, you know, the, the hesitation is coming from, let's say, if, if, you're, if your day-to-day -day job is working on drugs. It's Desiree, I'm gonna to comment too. Um, I think with the consumerism of healthcare, the entire industry is changing and certainly patients are the end user of our products and it would be kind of a shame to create all these great products and not ensure that they're having a good experience or that they understand what's going on or that they're even able to access them. So I feel like at least at Otsuka, why we do it is because it's truly living our purpose. Um, our purpose shapes our commitment to patients and our approach 
and our decisions and our focus. And so I believe it is about true patient centricity and involving them throughout the process to make sure that we're delivering solutions to them ultimately that will lead to better outcomes as was previously stated. And I think all these other elements are kind of the cherry on top. Like, yes, of course it will um, prove it to payers and there'll be new services and new products. But I think if we keep that kind of eye on the, on the patient and what they really need, that's where all of this great outcome actually comes from. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, I'm very well aware that there have been quite a few more um, uh, audience questions coming in, so I'm going to read a few more of those and we can perhaps tackle those. We've not got much, very long left, so we're going to have to do this relatively quickly. Um, Daniel, a few people have asked for more details about the paper that you mentioned. I don't suppose you can tell us more, maybe the title or how we can get hold of it. Uh, I think there's probably about five or six people who've asked for that. Um, We'd be interested, there's some interest, there's, there's a lot of interest in the R&D side of things, I have to say, amongst the questions. Um, uh, your thoughts on US FDA patient-focused drug development guidance or EMA's patient-focused medicine development in influencing business decisions. Um, somebody, Maurice, asks, according to nudge theory, could behavioral changes complement patient engagement, uh, even small news noodles? I'm not entirely sure that was exactly written correctly, possibly by smartphone. Um, perhaps, Claire, that uh, behavioral uh, topic is uh, of interest to you. Um, how do you eliminate biases in prioritizing which of the insights will be most valuable in designing new program offerings for patients? You can't do everything. Uh, what about the lack of consistency of care? Uh, this is from Carol, who is a patient. Patients struggle to see the same HCP anymore. This causes a lot of trust barriers. So how do you uh, even out the uh, service? Um, and perhaps that's a a healthcare question more than a pharma question, but can pharma do anything? Um, a few people said uh, they wish that there were a couple more options on the uh, last poll. Um, for example, focus on R&D to drive better science, drive better outcomes. I'm sorry about that, but um, we uh, we only have five options that we can uh, put into the system. So uh, perhaps I uh, I chose the wrong ones. I don't know, but I couldn't put everything. I'm afraid. Uh, and Maurice apologizes. Instead of noodles, he meant nudges. In case anyone's confused by that. <laughs> okay. So uh, a few questions there. Anyone Paul? want to tackle any of those? Paul. Paul, because I have been asked a question directly, uh, let me kickstart. Yes. So for the people who like to Google, it's uh, Bennett Levitan is the author, but I'll make your life easier and I won't be reading a title over the webinar. I'll send the link to Paul and I'm sure that Paul has a fantastic system of dispatching that to everyone who is on the paradigm, on the, uh, I think on the that call could here. possibly be arranged. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. And then I think we, I, I, at least from, from the answer point of view, I think we'd love to see FDA and EMA getting involved. Uh, I mean, we need a regulatory environment to support this patient engagement, to recognize the need of patient engagement and to, at a certain moment, also reward the patient engagement. So basically it's, it's key that these stakeholders uh, work forward. We, we we are involved in, in, in shaping that, so I think that's a good thing. It's also open to other stakeholders. And patients are, are, are interested in too. And we also um, see the IMI project, uh, so the um, Innovative Medicine uh, Initiative at the European level, where Paradigm is trying to set up a, a, a framework where all the stakeholders can recognize how patient engagement should happen. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to these tools because, as Oliver suggested in the very beginning, after you have a mental shift and you get there, if people recognize the need, then you still need to have the framework. So seeing these um, regulators work towards that is, is a good thing. Thank you. Who else? I can, I can pick up the, the nudge Please. or the noodles theory, if you like. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so, I think it was yeah. nudge theory, although I kind of <laughs> like the idea of noodle theory, well, I have to be honest. Um, but I, I missed absolutely. out on lunch today. <laughs> Um, but absolutely, and and I think you know, although I'm I'm a, a health psychologist, you know, the what actually we look to do is is to what can we learn from all the kind of behavioural sciences that that can help us to to build out those solutions. So certainly things like nudge theory around you know how can we start to prompt and you know I, I think a lot of that comes in certainly when we're doing designs around. You know, let, let's get somebody started, let's get them upskilled, but then how are we then supporting them along that journey? And that can be things like 
prompts it can be you know even tailoring sort of reminders or, or tailoring information that that's relevant to that individual um, and another you know another area also kind of pulling in behavioral economics as well so how how do we make these services you know as easy to use as easily accessible removing some of those barriers because what we don't want to do is to to put a service in place that has all these great intentions but is so unwieldy or or so you know kind of onerous that that it actually becomes another another weight to carry if you like um so we do need to be looking at, at those kind of elements of, of behavioral science as well um, that aren't just around the insights but are around how do we make um you know the the services that we're putting in place really engaging and really user friendly and you know as seamless as you know your your iphone for example even though they're glitching right now but but you know what i mean so definitely i think there's there's a whole realm of things we can pull in from from behavioral science uh, not just on the insights but also then how you execute those services Claire, I think we've lost you there at the very end. Um, I don't know if you can can hear me. I hope you can. Um, but uh, we heard you most of the way. Um, okay. Let's. Oh, you're back again now. Um, okay. I think you were just making your you're finishing anyway. Um, okay. Does anyone else have anything? Sorry, I'm just very aware of time. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, we've only got a couple of minutes, I'm going to actually put a final question in front of you. We're not really going to have time to talk about it, but it'd be nice to gather the data anyway, because we've got such a good audience today. Um, many companies are trying to take a more cross-functional approach. This is actually something we talked about in the preparation, but we haven't actually covered it so much today, uh, to building around the patient. Uh, and then obviously getting our internal resources right is key. But this question allows you to rate yourself how advanced do you believe your company to be? Once again, if you're not from a pharma company, maybe you can talk on behalf of clients. Uh, so at the very top, all patient engagement is cross-functional and coordinated. So obviously you're giving yourself good marks if you choose that one. Pockets of good cross-functional approach, perhaps depending on the country or the therapy. Uh, perhaps you've got particularly motivated individuals uh, or particularly great uh, teams that are good at sharing. Uh, thirdly, we're in the process, so we're, we're, we're getting there, uh, of building cross-functional teams. We're still at the planning stage, so that means you haven't really started implementation yet. Or finally, we have no plans to implement cross-functional approaches. So where do you sit on that spectrum? Let's hold that open a few seconds. Once again, I've got 50% of you voted. Uh, let's hold it open three more seconds. Get a few more of you, please. Three, two, one. Right, thank you very much, everybody. Let's have a look at the results once again. And uh, right, so I hope you can all see that. Um, we are quite good is going to be my quick summary of that. Um, we There's a good fifth of people who chose the top mark uh, and very few people choosing the bottom. Um, I'm sorry to hear that 3% of you are, are have no plans whatsoever, um, but uh, it's, it's, it's variable, I think is the best we can say right now. Okay, so panel, you've got 10 seconds each because we have actually hit the hour just right now. So you've got 10 seconds each to summarize uh, any thoughts on this or what you believe we need to do next. Perhaps I'll focus it on that because you've got such a short amount of time to respond. So what do we need to do next? And I'm going to actually start with Teresa. Teresa, what do we need to do next? Sorry, I was, I was on mute. That's all right. Uh, guys, I think, um, I think you are doing a great job. Really. Um, <laughs> so be, be faith, have some faith in ourselves. Is that what you're saying? I do. I, and, and what, I, what I would say is that um, uh, you need to work a little bit more on the trust aspect mm -hmm. so that patients really see that you guys are part of the team and that you are not working only out of your own interests. This is what I would say. Thank you. Okay, Teresa, those are very wise words. Uh, who else wants to give a final 10 seconds? I'll say it, everyone, look at what the um, Paradigm Project in IMI comes out with, which is a framework for patient engagement. Go and see your boss and say, we need to do the same. And if everybody does that at whatever level they are, we'll get there. Great advice. Thank you. 
think what is important is communicate back, you know. So, I mean, now initial experiences have been made, but uh, I think the outcomes, the real tangible outcomes have not been shared widely, especially not externally, and but I also don't think internally for most organizations, so that people can be confident that this is a, uh, an activity worthwhile. Excellent. Yeah, good That's point. Right. Agree. So one last comment, I think for me, what it all boils down to is mapping the patient journey with patients, validating the assumptions and agreeing on the problems they're trying to solve, and then course correcting as necessary uh, over time. Excellent. And finally, Claire. I think my my final thing would be a, a quick win. So if you can try and maybe do one change within the way that you're you're looking at your insights and tackling the problem is give yourself three teams. So have a team that looks at how we're going to support capability. So how are we going to train and educate? Have a part of that team looking at how can we influence opportunity? So what are the what what's the HCP doing? What's their access like, you know, particularly in markets like the US and Canada? And then give a team motivation. So give them that middle column around what's happening for that patient how do we need to empower their confidence and you know address some of their emotional needs and i think that's just you know even a quick way to start to shift thinking when you're doing not just your insights but also your service design excellent thank you wise words um really appreciate that uh claire really appreciate you and your team particularly as i said at the beginning for helping us uh, get this webinar up and running we've had a very engaged audience so i want to say a huge thank you to uh to you guys as well almost all of you who started the journey on this webinar are still with us uh and uh, of course huge thanks to our panel for being willing to share, give us their energy, give us their insights. Uh, and uh, I'm also getting lots of thank you messages and well said messages, I think, uh, coming through now from some of those final comments as well from the audience. So uh, oh, what a great knowledge, ex knowledge exchange. Uh, lots, of, lots of positive comments. Uh, if you enjoy this kind of conversation, if you find that uh, you uh, can advance your own work, uh, then please do come and have a bit more of it uh, face to face. Join us in 2020. We've got our Barcelona event, uh, March 31st to April 2nd. We've got our Philadelphia event, April 15th to 16. All of the people you see on your screen right now are going to be uh, talking about the topics we've talked about in Barcelona. Teresa is also a speaker there. Daniel will be there. Um, very much looking forward to uh, advancing, really moving the needle on this stuff. Uh, we don't just gather people together for the fun of it. We are only here to push the industry forward. And indeed, when it comes to this stuff, that means pushing patients uh, forward towards better outcomes as well. Any comments you've got, please send them through. I'm going to hold the webinar open for two more minutes to allow you to write any suggestions, ideas, uh, expressions of love, whatever it is that motivates you in the final seconds here. And um, very much looking forward to hearing your thoughts going forward. Hopefully see you face to face in one of those locations very soon. And uh, really appreciate uh, all your contributions once again. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Be back with you very shortly. Bye then. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Bye all. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.